to the class today. <clears throat> the uh, lesson I sent out to, for review was something I'd sent out in the beginning. It was the history of spiritual healing. And yeah. the reason that I think that that's important is because it goes through all the stages of spiritual healing since the beginning of recorded history. And this is a paper that I wrote when I was studying to be a healer to accomplish one of the curriculum items. So I researched it and brought this information out. And basically it jumps from the beginning, the very primitive uh, level of types of practices with healing, where it was um, basically the witch doctor syndrome, and I'm not putting down voodoo or anything like that, but that's just an era, a description of the era. And that basic persona very closely kept all of the information to themselves. It was only taught to very exclusive people. And they were feared as much as they were sought out for help in the groups and the communities that they were in. But they still produced a belief in something beyond what people understood at the time. So it still raised people's consciousness, even though it was a bit restrictive. Then the more benevolent generation of it moved into basically the, um, the medicine man or the shamanistic type healing where the practitioner was very a very nice person. They shared a certain amount of the information so that people could use it in their daily lives rather than having it just come to them. They shared the knowledge to raise people's life, uh, lifestyles, to help them feel more comfortable, to allow them a little bit of self-empowerment about their lives. So again, the consciousness of people was raised through the healing practices. The actual historical parts of this, uh, the first at recorded times of this was back in about 450 or 60 BC with the rise of the Celtic race. And this race of people rose to prominence through the oracles that worked with them at the time and part of their ministry was healing and they were very well practiced with healing arts and this this whole movement came about from an obscure tribe called the Hermans in the northern steppes of Europe and these people started having this one woman went into a trance in the middle of a battle that was about to occur and gave some information about the battle to the chieftains, which was unheard of. You know, most women were little more than cattle at the time, or livestock, and had no rights. And she spoke in a trance at a council of war and warned them about some things that were going to happen. And they just looked and they investigated. She had said that there was another army or tribe surrounded, hiding, waiting for the battle to start that was mm -hmm. going to fall on both of the battling tribes mm -hmm. and enslave both of them. And she warned them about that. And it was like a, uh, it was a father and a son's tribe that was going to fight. So they were trying to wipe out the entire clan. So she warned them about it through the spiritual visionary and they sent scouts and they kept on acting like they were going to fight. And they found these <coughs> tribes and fell on them and secrecy and overcame them instead of being overcome themselves. And from that point forward, this woman, Velusta, the first recorded meeting in pagan history, began to sit under trees and give uh, advice. And she was actually the founder of the Druid Colleges that we know today. And they began to only teach women. Only women were brought in. So this began to be the beginning of a culture of raising women's status within the culture through healing and spiritual vision. Right? So again, you see these spiritual arts raising the lifestyle, casting off ignorance, and moving people forward without a lot of force. Unfortunately, the, uh, the first outbreak of the Black Plague happened and they were unable to cure it. So they, and the men were getting a little antsy about all of this. So, and the, the Druid colleges were getting really powerful because oracles were going to all the tribes and that's how it became the Celtic races. All these obscure tribes banded together under the guidance of the Hermans and became this huge force for centuries in that part of the world. And they, they were beginning to be a little frightened about this, the power that this all-woman organization was having. Because again, this is a matter of a decade maybe where they went from obscurity to running 
the civilization. So they began to get a little concerned. And then when the outbreak of the Black Plague occurred, the, they were unable to cure the Black Plague. So they instituted what they called human sacrifices to take the message straight to the gods. And it just got real convenient that all the messengers that were, it was an honor to be sacrificed apparently, <laughs> were all the influential men or their sons. Mm -hmm. So they began to have a little bit of difficulty with that. And there was an individual called Rama at the time. And he's mentioned in the Vedic literatures that you read about. That's the Rama that set up the caste system in India. And he, through his... Um, through his wanderings had come across a healing method. Uh, so into this era we see Rama coming. Again, this is the individual that's mentioned in the Vedic literatures. Set up a caste system in India, and the way that that happened was in the northern steppes of Europe, when he's wandering around, he begins to cure the uh, black plague through spiritual vision and a concoction of mistletoe. Um, and he was supposed to have received this inspiration of how to, to cure mistletoe through a spiritual dream where a spirit came to him by the name of Aeoscopolis. And now we know that as time progresses, there was a family of doctors called Aeoscopolis. And it's also mentioned in the Greek literature about this, this individual. They were almost mentioned by gods. And this, so back to the previous time when he's re receiving his spiritual vision, he began to cure the black plague. His patients began to recover. Well, Velaspa, who at that time was head of the Druid colleges, kept sending summons to him to come before the council, which was all women. And he ignored it. He refused to come before the council. And eventually, like I said, the culture was that it was a man-dominated society. So they eventually put Rama in charge of the Druid colleges. And then men began to be taught healing arts as well as the mediumistic and oracle <coughs> arts, not just women in that era. So it was more, it became a more open college at that time. And they threw out the human sacrifices that had been put into place. And through Rama's and, and the college's guidance, the Druid schools, they began to take over city after city. And one of their practices was most of the cities just became part of the nation because he left the governments in place, he brought them healing arts, he brought them a lot of culture that they didn't have. So it was a benefit to them without ever having a fight to do that. And then he moved into what was called the Seven Years' War with India. And he organized all of the pagan uh, tribes over there and overcame them in what they call the Seven Years' War. And again, this is mentioned in the Vedic literatures from India, the Buddhist uh, scripts. And as that war progressed, they began to finally have it settled. And he set up the Brahmanic caste system, which was very exclusive at, in its time because it said that you had to be born of a certain race of people to be a certain craft. And of course, all the ruling people had families that were born from family to family, like the royal blood philosophy. And um, Krishna came and was supposed to have thrown all that out, but it's still all pretty well in place over there, even though that's what they say Krishna did with his ministry. But Rama was the, the, the next prominent one. And then you move forward in time to where you had the, the Aeoscopolis and his group, uh, his family, it was actually a family name, where they, they were the, in that time you had to travel great distances to these temples to receive healing. They were the first ones to institute, quote, house visits. So their practitioners began to go out and practice to the public at large. So once again, through Rama, the consciousness of people was raised through healing and the, and the spiritual gifts and then again through this family it began to be more benevolent reaching out rather than because in that time you had to travel a lot of distance and it was very hard to travel it was by foot you had to stay overnight you had to pay a lot of money and the population was very poor at that time so it was very arduous to make those journeys mm -hmm. then you come come to the next era of people which was um, 
Hippocrates. And Hippocrates was the first one, and to his benefit and his discredit, he separated out spiritual belief from medical practices. He was the one that split the two up. Until that time, you had what they called priest physicians, where they were religiously based as well as based within the healing arts. So his is the one that split it up, but he also created an oath that said that you know anyone is available to the to receive healing regardless of ability to pay. Um, and his abacus, this the healing symbol, that was the symbol of his healing art, and that was also Aeschylus's family's symbol. Except well, they changed it a little bit, but it's still the basic symbol. So you can see that this history has been around for a long time of healing. The uh, Spiritual healing craft, modern day spiritual healing, was very largely promoted by a group from the Harry Edwards Healing Sanctuary in the United Kingdom. And they're still very active today, even though Harry Edwards has passed the spirit. But he moved into an era in the 40s and 50s where it was very exclusive. You know, they thought that it was a little more than hoodoo and bunk. And through his practices. He set up a code of healing for healers. He got them organized into a professional fashion. He got them to wear professional garbs with white. Had an established code of healing that the British government accepted. And now they practice side-by-side -side hospitals. It's not uncommon for a doctor to refer a patient to one of these healing practitioners over there. They also embrace homeopathy. They embrace numerous types of healing that's beyond the allopathic type. So there is a lot of um, changes that went on through these people, and not in the United States so much. They still kind of uh, restricted a lot. I studied homeopathy for a while, and back at the turn of the century, 18 to 1900s, there was a a lot of the colleges taught homeopathy as well as allopathic medicine side by side. And then the pharmaceutical companies came in and said, if you teach homeopathy, we're not going to fund your colleges. So in about the 1920s and 30s, they stopped teaching homeopathy in the colleges as a viable medicine practice. And they were very well sought after healers because it, they don't believe in surgery. They believe strictly, and the, and the medications they use have no chemical properties to them. It's all energetic. It's all succussed and diluted beyond down below Avogadro's number, which is the least number, which is the number that a molecule has to have to maintain its physical properties. So they take these different substances that affect something in a specific way, and they succuss and dilute it down to where it's just the energy of the medicine. All any homeopathic medicines you see are going to diagnose the same. They're all going to come out basically as sugar pills and water. But the energetics of that substance has been in, imbibed into that pill. And I studied it for a number of years, and it's a very viable system. It's just very difficult because it's based on the individuality of the person. There's no, this medicine works for these people with all these symptoms. It's, it's a, you have to go through a huge two-hour diagnosis process called rubrics language. And it, kind of, and it develops it down to a number which develops it to a, a specific medication for that person. So there's a, this, this is the history, though, coming into the United States. But Harry Edwards is one of the most prominent ones, most organized, has the most instant, And you can write, you can see him online, you can write to him. They send out a healing magazine every couple months. Um, you can join them. They got what they call a healing minute where they want, it's at 10 o'clock, their entire healing organizations all around the world meditate on healing to the world at large every day at 10 o'clock. And you can join for like, they call it 10 pounds, that's about $15. And you get a little pin and they send you reminders and it's just a nice networking. Plus they do a lot of distance healing. Harry Edwards' healings were evidenced by physical healing. He would do public healing demonstrations, and this is in the 50s and 60s, I believe it was. He would, he would take children with arthritic limbs and just sit there and start massaging them, and the limbs would straighten out and begin to function again. 
a lot of physical healings like that he would do demonstrations with. Uh, and his, his theory was that eventually spiritual healing is going to be practiced as simple as mothers putting band-aids on their children's hands because the healing is that natural. It shouldn't be ritualistic. It shouldn't be confined. It shouldn't be you know, held in, in trust by groups that should be taught openly. Um, his, his practices and his philosophies are very widely practiced. You can get tapes on it. It's a wonderful healing thing. And they've got a huge history of all these case histories of have people that have had a distance. They believe in working at a distance first. And we've talked a little bit about distance healing as a form of development for your personal healing. And that methodology of uh, distance healing partially came from his training that I gave out in that one class. So they believe in distance healing. They write letters every two weeks. If you put somebody or yourself on their list, they send you a letter every two or three weeks wanting to know how the condition is. Because their theory is a lot like homeopathy. As it, as it cures, it begins to change in its characteristics. So you have to keep changing a little bit your conscious application. The directed healing method we practiced last week came from his practice, that philosophy of directing healing to a specific area. And that's coupled with that chart that I showed a couple of times. And I think Alice and Charlie said you can get this thing online for 50 cents or 90 cents or something. That's a very detailed chart. So that's some of the things that the history of healing has brought about. My final summary of that was that the healing, healing has done more to advance the spirituality of mankind than anything else. Because when you're, when you're in a difficult place and your life's not going right, physically, from illnesses, uh, <coughs> hunger, whatever it is, you don't think anything else. And if people are healthy, living a happy life, their mind opens up to the higher minded studies. Uh, you can read that history. It's like I said, it's something that I put together from reading a number of different books. And it's just, I, I find it, I, and it's on my website too. You can download it for free or I can, every week I send out an email and if you want these lessons, I can send them to you digitally. Plus the film, the video, videotaping the class, and I put it on YouTube if you want to review it or share this philosophy with anybody else. So, I'll keep it to time here today because I want to get a lot of hands-on work today. Um, the uh, way that we're going to work today is we'll review the directed healing first. And I've got some extra charts here for people, for people that came here. You know, David said that his computer didn't work. And I got my printer working again, so let's see. Can I just see which one that is, Steve? Oh, okay, I think I have that. Oh, I'll show you. And the methodology that I use for him, the first part's an interview, so I'd like you to go through all three stages today with the person I carried with. This chart and review. If somebody, this chart was developed over 200 years of spiritual healing. And I think a seminar on it wrote down as much as I could remember. They didn't hand out any handouts. So there are some areas in there that don't like where there's question marks. I don't remember what that was. But basically, if you somebody says, like the first one, they say the base of their spine is giving them a lot of problems. What happens with that? is that at some point you ask them to go back to the first time they began to be aware of that issue. And you say, two weeks to two months prior to the first time that you had that issue. Uh, I have an extra copy if anybody needs it. Yeah, I can. Oh. <laughs> I can make your copy uh, for you. Huh? Unless somebody else can. Uh, Thank you. So if you have a base of the spine issue, if somebody is saying that they have a base of the spine issue, 
you ask them to go back to the first time they remembered feeling that, and then think back two weeks to two months before that, and there will have been emotional challenge in one of those three listed items. Now, we all have challenges with this to a minor sense every day, but this is something that was all encompassing. If it was a family, it was a death in the family, somebody being put in jail, a terminal illness or a severe sickness. It's something that was very encompassing of the person's thought and time and affected them very much. And what happens with this, the reason it affects specific areas of the body by the theory of this seminar, my personal philosophy, is that it affects a particular point of your spiritual matrix, which the biological flesh is greater. And this particular point of that matrix becomes weakened, so the flesh becomes weakened in that area. Now, everybody, I know we've all heard thoughts are things, and you injure your body by thought, but that's not necessarily the case. That's in a very basic sense how it happens, but the actual mechanics of it is that this repetitive thought weakens that spiritual matrix point. And then they bend over and pick up something they picked up a hundred times and they injure their back because of the weakening of that area. So it's not that the thought weakened the back muscles, it weakened the spiritual matrix or the energetic matrix that the body is draped over on, in a spiritual sense. So the purpose of this is that you get them to think about that event, think about it as an entire experience, not so much think of all the people that, that were involved in it and try to forgive them. It's like seeing a movie and having a feeling about the movie at the end of the movie. You don't go back and relive every event in the movie, but you have a definite feeling about the movie. And people have a, a, a summary, summarized feeling about these major events in their life. <coughs> Frustration, anger, there's an overriding experience that they have. And even if it's happened 10 years ago and they haven't completely resolved it, it's just continually affected that area. So you just have them think about that as an event and just try to think a little softer about it. Not go back and forgive everybody that things that happen or seek everybody's forgiveness for something you've done, but just feel softer about the event. And it changes the way that the energy works with them. Just begin to soften the feeling about it. And be sure to tell them that if it, they don't resolve this, it's not going to mean they won't get healed because spiritual healing overrides that to a lot of extents. But this is a way to do an interview process with the person. And usually my interview processes take, take about 20 minutes, but it's not just about this. <coughs> I ask them questions like, what's your greatest fear about this? What's your greatest hope with this? So, so there are other questions that you're inspired to ask. And I use this, and I use this during that process. So when they're, if they say the base of their spine, there's a... There's something right here, so I just begin to think about that while I'm talking to the person. And what you're doing is you're building a visual imagery in your mind, and you're building a energetic vision by asking them what their feelings are about it. And all of this visionary and imaging goes to the mirror of the mind's eye, where the spirit begins to see it in an exact sense how it's seen in the physical. Spirit people have a hard time seeing the physical, just like we have a hard time seeing the spiritual. So we act as the physical connecting link for the spirit. That's what you do as a healer. You have to have this, this mating, this intervention, so to speak, with all healing events, because if people could be healed just by desire, then we could have no illness in the world, because nobody wants to be sick. So there has to be a natural law of intervention where there's a physical intermediary that allows the physical connection from the spirit realm to the physical realm with an intended purpose. And that's what this does, is it builds that imagery, it builds that, that emotion of the person, it builds a complete feeling for the spirit to know and work with. So this is all building that part of it. And then as you 
begin to, the next portion is the guided visionary of the, uh, trying to get the person to heal themselves through their own body's healing reserves. And that's where I just begin to ask them to go through a process of feeling their body, feeling the different systems of their body, asking the part of their mind that controls the automatic systems to begin to pay attention to areas that it's not paying that much attention to. It's just a lot of visionary that you get them involved in. And these, this part is what people remember more than anything else because they can do it at home. It's a simple guide through basically the anatomical processes, feeling the, the connection from the mind of God to your mind. And um, I can do just a, if somebody wants to sit here, I can give you a, a demonstration of that before we do it because we've all, the contact healing isn't that difficult to remember how to do. But the guiding people through the personal healing is a little different of a concept to this type of healing. But you need to get all the bases. You have to build the picture. You have to get the person involved. And then you as a spiritual healer, as the third portion, connect to the spirit healing mind that's there to work with them. And you transmit that spirit healing presence in personality and in intelligence intact to the person through you. So you're transmitting this entire persona and spirit through your intentions, through your attunement to, and meditation to the person, through your physical connection to them. Once that physical to physical connection is made and the spirit moves from you to them, then the spirit is able to work with them after that session without you being there. The spirit then has become personalized to that person. You, they, they've had the, the connection to the physical plane through the healing session. So that's the, the philosophy of how all of this works in my mind. That's not the only way that healing works. It's not the way that healing works. It is the way that I have come to practice it through numerous different disciplines and through my own practice of over 25 years and seeing it work. So you can take pieces and parts of it. You can mix up the pieces and parts with healing systems you already know. It isn't a complete system that can't be taken apart. It's information for you to, to, to enhance what you already know, to add to what you already know, to adapt it any way you want to. So I'm just going to teach you the entire system that I use. But again, if you choose to only use the interview process, it works just fine personal healing process, it works just fine standalone, and the contact healing portion works just fine standalone. It's not something that can't be piecemeal. So you work your own way, it's information for you to work with. So the, this chart takes a little bit of practice. It's not, it's like I said, it's stuff that I wrote down. So you have to read the emotional challenges and kind of know a little bit about them. It's a, like if you go down to center three, emotional challenges to self-respect, self-esteem. That's a little, it's a little subjective about how you interpret that. But again, it's a guideline for the energy that has caused that issue. And it doesn't mean that they have no self-respect or no self-esteem. It can, but what it can also mean is that their concept of self-respect has been severely challenged by the event they were in. You know, there's been this huge uh, questioning that goes on with them about what they believe as a person. That can cause the same issue as them losing their complete self-respect, just the quandary of trying to resolve what's happened before them with their own personal philosophy about self-respect. So this, these are the things that you have to work with a little bit on this chart, and it takes a little bit of practice uh, to do this. Any questions about anything I've said? Went over a lot quick, so I'm, I'm sorry, but it's usually these classes are taught over about a six-month period, so I'm just trying to help get people to uh, absorb what they are able to absorb and what they need to absorb in the short time that we have. Well, I think it'll just help to see you do, you know, okay. uh, do a process. Do a pro yeah, okay. yeah, that'll help. So uh, the visual. Okay. Uh, well, I don't. We don't have an hour for me to do my process, and then for you to do it. But we can. Um, and the 
problem with doing it on camera is that I'm actually working with a person in a personal sense. And then, I mean, I don't mind doing the meditations, but the interview process, I think, would be a little bit questionable to have that on YouTube for the whole world to see. So I would, I'd be happy to do the um, guided meditation, and we have practiced the hands on which we will again, and I'll guide you through that as we get to doing it. So I'll show, show you how I do the guided meditation part for personal healing, for bringing up the body's reserves. There's a tremendous healing ability within the body itself, beyond any spiritual healing, beyond anything else. The healing reserves of the body, if properly tapped, can do anything that needs to be done. So it's, it's like my original homeopathy teacher said, you load all your guns and you shoot them all at once. You don't just concentrate on one modality. You use everything you can to help the people to come to you. Here. She's cured. That was a quick one. Spiritual healing can be used to enhance a good life and make it better. Yes, exactly. Um, I think that if anything, I would want to use it to, um, you know, and I to connect with your your guides and your. Okay, so spiritual awareness. Right, okay. or a, a more in tune spiritual awareness. Okay, we can, I can incorporate that into the vision. I'm still going to go through if you have yes. an ailment so that people can... I sneeze. <laughs> okay. well, I have allergies. Well, oh, there, ah, go. there we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that's a good life's happening now. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Usually you want them to remove anything that's constricting and you want to take anything off that's constricting. Uh, because as you move through this, it gets more and more sensitive. So you don't want to have constricting clothes or any necklaces, wrist bands, anything like that. As the practitioner, but you have a lot of stuff, so I might ask you to take that off. But normally you would ask them to remove restrictive things, not because it's metal in it detracts from the healing energy, but just the sensitivity of the person increases greatly toward the door during this, so you want them to be relaxed and as comfortable as they can be. <clears throat> in-breath and out-breath, you begin to now feel a 
that higher sense of the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath as a renewal of life, breath by breath, moment by moment. As you begin to feel that sense of the higher connection of the breath, you begin to feel your body and all of its potentials, all of its existence, all of the systems within you. First you feel it as a whole, just as a complete sense. Then you begin to feel the part of your mind that controls all of these automatic functions, the beating of the heart, the pulsing of the breath, the vibration of the nervous system. You feel all of these automatic functions that are controlled by a particular part of your mind. And as you feel that part of your mind, you begin to feel it as its own entity, its own consciousness. And you begin to think to it, thank it for all the wonderful things that it's done for you. Thank it for all the attention that it's paid to the body, all of its dedication and kindness that it's done for you in the past. And as you feel this communion with this part of your mind, I want you now to begin to visualize to it and tell it that there's an area within your body that it's not paying enough attention to. And as you visualize this area to that part of your mind and ask it to pay extra attention to that area, you feel it beginning to focus on that area. And you feel first a vibration down the nervous system to that part of your body as it begins to send intentions, thoughts, and then you begin to feel the blood system responding, sending the healing nutrients and the energetics of healing to that area of the body. It begins to send this additional help, this additional hope to this area of the body. As this physiological process begins to work, I want you now to sense the center of that area physically. See your sinuses and feel all thoughts that have been stored there of the distress of this area. And let those thoughts begin to flow back into your body, down your neck, and out your chest as if waves of heat dissipating into the air away from you. you. Begin to feel this draining of thought out of this area, the draining of any distrust, any disease in this area, flowing away from it, down the spine, into the chest, and dissipating as it waves of heat in the air away from you. This is beginning to feel as if you pull a stopper out of a sink of water, and it flows down the drain and away. This too is how the thoughts in this area will leave this part of the body. A continuous process as a sense of neutrality begins to fill this area. You want now to feel the thoughts in your mind of this area, your new thoughts of distress as a block of thought. See this as a block of thought, and now too begin to feel these thoughts drain down your spine, into your chest, and dissipate as it waves of heat into the air away from you. Gently leaving the body, gently creating a sense of neutrality there, allowing this healing sense from the mind of your health, from the mind healing the natural portions of your body, to flow into this area of neutrality, feeling the healing begin to take place, begin to feel healing issues and thoughts taking place in the mind. Feel this attention of the automatic part of your mind. I want you now to feel a connection at the top of your mind, from your mind to God's mind. And as you feel this connection from your mind to God's mind, I want you to feel yourself as a thought in the mind of God. As you feel yourself as a thought in the mind of God, I want you to remember that only perfectly harmonious and balanced and whole thought 
thoughts can exist within the mind of God. And I want you to feel that thought, that creative thought that God has about you to flow down this connection into your mind and begin to feel that space in your mind with this grace and this light of the perfectly balanced you, the perfectly holy you, and the perfectly healthy you. As this energy and light now flows through the mind, over the body, into the area of difficulty, we feel the same light filling this area of the body. Perfect health, perfect balance, perfect wholeness, flowing down over the body gently, penetrating every cell, every atom of the body as it goes with this light of health wholeness and happiness, flowing down the body, over the limbs, down the torso, and as it touches every area of the body, relaxing, uplifting, and healing, moving down the legs, into the knees, and down into the feet, until the entire body is encompassed in the spiritual body. Relaxing and letting your body vibrate at this higher rate of energy, feeling yourself changed and shifted from this moment forward, breathing in this energy, making it your own, breathing in this energy, making it a permanent part of you, feeling an inward peace with all that is occurring. As you feel this moment, this wholeness, and just allow it to uplift you and hold you. This is all that you feel for the moment. Breathing rhythmically, making this energy your own. As you feel yourself floating on the sea of creation, the sea of life, allowing your body to find its own natural natural balance, natural harmony. I don't bring them back. I let them sit there and it takes about 10 minutes before the energy runs its own cycle. And they will generally just open their eyes by themselves after about 10 minutes. It's just the nature of how the energy works. 
and it's better to let that energy find its own cycle like that and just let them come out of it themselves. If they're in more than about 15 minutes, then you need to do a retrieval like I just did. Gentle, easy, take your time, don't rush them. You know, just take it easy, be sensitive, because this is about them, not about you or your next appointment. So take your time, let them come back in their own fashion, let them make the energy their own like I did. And they will gently begin to come back and just like, Kathy did. Normally, at the end of that, what I would do is I would stand up and move behind them and start doing the contact healing like we practice in class. And I would sit back down here and just wait until they came back. And usually after you do the contact healing, the directed healing method that I've taught and we'll go over today again, they will come back after about 10 minutes when the process is completed. The only difference is, is when you end the spiritual healing, you don't tell them that it's over. You just sit down quietly and let the process take its, its normal course. Because what's happening is the spirit's working with them. The natural energy that you had to help them connect to is finding its own place. It doesn't run on your schedule. It runs on its own schedule. So you have to get the time to naturally complete its work. Good question. <coughs> Obviously, you're an old pro. <laughs> there are a lot of concepts that just flow. Is it okay to use an outline? Yes. Yes, it is. Because yeah. you're, you know, you're you're sitting there with nothing, almost in, in the in the <coughs> state as, as, right. as your subject. Right. You're not referring to anything; it just comes to you naturally. Mm -hmm. You have a very long time to get that down. I think. Well, what you do is you find visionary that works for you. Mm -hmm. It's natural to how you think. You know, how you think about God, how you think about your relationship to other people. You build a vision ray that's natural to you. That's how you remember it. And it can be colors. You can use a color meditation for self-healing. But it's important to contact the part of your mind that's the automatic healing portion of your body for the, for the personal healing. That's, that's one key visualization that you want to remember is to talk about that part of the mind, get it involved in the process. And you know, be kind to it, thank it for the work it's done, you know. Don't, don't get, you better get busy here, you know. You have to kind of be kind to it, be gentle with it. And that gets the personal healing portion involved. And then you bring in that visionary for the spiritual healing, the concept of the mind of God and the grace of God working with them in any fashion. It doesn't have to be that exact flow of visionary, just the basic concept of it, however you choose to represent that concept. So you just kind of, you know, you use similar things in your meditation if you meditate. You know, you can do the same. It's like doing a meditation, but you're sharing it, basically. Because like you said, I'm as far off as they are. And I wouldn't want to sound scripted. Well, you have to sound scripted in the beginning. And what happens is, I never say the same thing to two people I worked with, I think Alice last week, and I didn't say the same thing to her. It, you begin to become intuitive about the person, you sense the person's personality, and you begin to say different things that they find more agreeable than your scripted approach. It's going to connect to their, their soul, so to right. speak. You're right. speaking to their soul. That's correct. And you begin to be very individual with that rather than scripted. But we as people, like when I do a lecture, i got to have a written lecture, and I never stick to it. But I have it there to make myself feel good. So if you want to have a scripted meditation, you can do that. So if you hit a blank spot, you can just kind of glance down and then pick it up from there. You know, because what happens is, it's just like meditation. When you do this, you can only stay connected so long and sometimes you hit them blank spots. So the scripted part's good. When you hit that blank spot, you can look down real quick and then get back into the flow. Because you can reconnect and get back into the flow if you have that. But if you hit that blank spot, you're going, ah, what should I say now? And you start stumbling around. And it doesn't quite flow that. I still have, I hit a couple spots like that here today, but you guys didn't catch it. So I did, you know. But there, you, you do hit those bumps, those hiccups, 
while you're doing it because your mind doesn't stay on the beam all the time. So you have to have that, that scripted approach helps with that. Any other questions? Well, just a, a comment. I like the way you had her um, empty out the blockages and the more negative right. feelings and then replace it instead of just putting the light in right. or, you know, whatever. Well, I yeah, like I that. would think you would have to. You mm -hmm. have to make room for the good. You have mm -hmm. to expel the bad. Yeah, but not everybody does good. that, so I like the way he did yeah. that. <laughs> the purpose of that is because it gets the person involved. The first part is really to get the person to take responsibility for their illness mm -hmm. and be involved in their own recovery rather than feel like a victim. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things you can help people do with terminal illnesses or illnesses that can't be removed by other means. You give them a sense of empowerment about themselves mm -hmm. again. You give them a tool they can work with and at home on their own and it gives them their sense of themselves back as well as a healing tool. So it's a multifaceted approach that really does help. Um, so I've never done that far with anybody that didn't say they felt some effect from it. Because you're getting them to do the thing. You're guiding them through their effort. The second yeah, I, portion. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I wasn't even doing the meditation. I was taking notes, but when you said that metaphor about pulling the stopper out of the sink, I mean, I could even feel that in my body, and I wasn't even doing the meditation. <laughs> so that was pretty powerful. <laughs> well, that's what you have to do is keep the vision very simple. You get too, too descriptive about walking down a path and smelling the flowers and seeing the different <laughs> colors. Their mind gets involved, and it gets too detailed, and their mind doesn't go intuitive and spiritual. It stays in the physical, so you want to keep your 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 visualization simple mm -hmm. and connected to them, not put them outside their body and mm -hmm. get them walking down paths or seeing mountain ranges or stuff like that, because that mm -hmm. brings in the imaginative portion of the mind, and it it's actually counterproductive to connect it with the spirit. And then they feel like they're not good at meditation right. because they can't get to the place. Right that they think they, that you, that they need to be right. because they're too busy looking for everything. Right. Right. Little clues that I, I'm on the right path. Mm -hmm. But this meditation keeps them internal. It keeps them connected to the visionary of who they are. It, it, it's simple. It's an easy visualization for them to work with. So that's, that's the basic characteristics that you want to do during the visualization process. Make it simple, make it personal for them, and keep it on no energy without putting a lot of colors to it, keeping on concepts like the mind of God, things like that, that we all believe in. I would say that I saw a lot of color, though. Good. It did, because it started out with a blue, mm -hmm. and it went to kind of a, a goldish color, and then to an orangey yeah. color. That's cool. So. But so you were allowed to get your own colors. Right. I didn't tell you what mm -hmm. color, so you got the full experience of yourself with those colors. And it's yeah, it was very hot. <laughs> and I'm never warm. <laughs> well, again, see, we've talked about that before. Extreme additional heat or additional coolness <coughs> is an indication of spirit presence. Right. And that's something that people will experience when you do that. You'll feel it, they'll feel it. And it was funny because last week Alice was working with me and I felt cold on my back. So, you know, it's one or the other, but either one indicates spirit presence. But everybody, when I work with people, they say they feel like they're sitting in a blast furnace when we've been there for an hour. <laughs> but, that, but again, that, that's a good indication of spirit presence. The other spirit presence we discussed during the contact healing, when you're touching them on their shoulders, they may feel a touch on their leg or a touch on their stomach, and you're not touching them. That's an indication of the spirit really working with them strong, mm -hmm. where there is a touching in another area. So yeah, sometimes when uh, toward the end, you know, when they take their hands off, sometimes I still feel them on there. It's like they haven't left. W would that be the same concept? Not really, because no? you're going to have a sensitivity where people, people touch you, but oh, this would be. Okay. Like you'll feel almost like somebody touching your leg or touching your stomach or oh, okay. something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be in a non-personal place. So if you're getting healing from somebody you don't know, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> don't necessarily think it's spirit now. So. <laughs>
Get up and run. <laughs> Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and see what's going on. Now, touches will all be appropriate. And like I said, the guidelines for touching with the contact portion, top of the shoulders, not below the middle of the shoulders, nothing in the center of the face, nothing in lower on the front of the body, man or woman. Now, if they have a knee problem, you can ask them if you can touch their knee, hand, something like that, an extremity, you can touch, but anywhere in the center of the body, in the front, you leave alone, male or female. Anywhere below the back of the shoulders, without permission, you don't touch below the middle of the shoulders. And, and I explain that to people when I begin the session, that I'm not going to touch anywhere other than that, because they need to know what to expect. Otherwise, they won't fully relax. You know, they'll always be, hmm, what, what's going to happen next? <laughs> so you just explain to them, get them relaxed in the beginning of what your modality is going to be. And you could say, well, if you have a problem with your knee, I may want to touch your knee. So when you get to that part, you just say, I'd like to touch your knee now. And you do the direct activity to the knee after the practice. Well, whatever you do, don't snap on a rubber glove. <laughs> 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 Thanks for the and say coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the visual. <laughs> okay.